Karen. How are you at home? I am. <laughs> how are you going? Not too bad at all. Not too bad. It, actually, how are you doing with the three kids quiet? Normally, we have at least Jack marauding in the background. What's going uh, on? Oh, yeah, I think you're speaking too soon, Andrew. I'm sure they'll make their way down here very <laughs> shortly. So, yeah. Well, we've had an interesting week, Karen. It's been busy. The uh, results came back from our survey around the health services we provide. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that fascinating? Very, very insightful and very useful to you and your firm. Yeah, so the, what the results showed is that around about 60% of our staff want to do the various activities like yoga, Pilates and meditation outside of working hours. We've always assumed people would like a break during working hours. G'day, Joe, how are you, mate? Um, what that actually does is save around about $3,000 of opportunity cost to say um, um, on a bad day, up to about $6,000 a day. That's, that's just out for our firm. But my point about it is, there's the saving in money, but now we're actually providing a service to people that they actually want at the time they want. And we've gone from offering two basic services around Pilates and yoga, um, where people have identified because of Karen's survey that she put together, the different types of things they'd like to do. And in, our instructors are wrapped. They can provide high intensity ones, relaxing ones. So we've actually able to give our staff what they want and it's less disruptive in working week and it fits into their lifestyle. So uh, I think evidence is a really important thing. And on that point of evidence, Karen. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, here we go. Just, so, <laughs> can I just say to you how disappointing the current rhetoric is around COVID. And there is this, this real comfort of saying we get to 80% fully vaccinated, which means over the age of 16, I might add. Um, when we get to that stage, we can open up and people feel safe. But the actual data, so if we go to the evidence, what the evidence shows us is that particularly in white, but in educated communities or communities who watch mainstream television and understand it, we are getting higher levels of vaccination rates and also no instance of illness because of high compliance around it. So when we get to 80%, what we're really doing is saying in communities which have fled despotic governments who, are fear, who don't have good health knowledge, who don't use health services, who don't speak English as a first language, who feel vulnerable and apprehensive around government, who don't comply with government rules because they don't understand them and don't get vaccinated. We're saying to that group, look, bad luck, you're dead. And remember, that group also has the highest level of health vulnerability because they don't access health services. So I'm all for opening up. I don't want to sound like I'm being difficult. I don't want to be doing what we're doing, but I do want us as a community to recognise that the anti-vax group that people are highly critical of is one or two percent. It's a tiny mm. portion of our community and who knows why they feel that way, but I don't care, okay? They make their choices. But when, when they say when we're fully vaccinated, people make a choice. No, there's a very large community of people who are not making a choice who we are saying it's okay for them to get sick and die. And I, yeah. I think as safety practitioners and professionals, let's stay with the evidence. And I think what that means is that we need um, mobile vaccinations into those communities. We need stronger engagement in the community. We need to be honest about what is the truth about this. And we need to stop talking to the educated voting groups who hold the margin electorates um, and do the right thing. Yes, Margaret, I agree with you. Uh, we just need to improve so much. And we need yeah. to stop this idea of the world's great after 80% because throughout the world, the phenomena that we have is being played out in every other Western country in the world. Mm -hmm. It's no different. That's enough of me ranting, but I want us to stay with the evidence because that's where we should be. And we should treat any person in our community yeah. as a member of our community, not as someone different. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really 100% minus the, you know, the the one or 2% in terms of anti-vaxxers or people who yeah, are really truly against it um, for, for no um, real ground, right? Um, but what about the remaining 18% who are just in that grey area? Or so, have legitimate health reasons for why they can't vaccinate. Yeah, right? we just We're have to do more. publish an article next week which lists the types of illnesses that prevent people from being vaccinated just to increase that level of awareness. Mm. And I, I guess that brings us to our toolkit that we've just finalised for mandatory vaccination. Um, Sophie, that is just incredible. Ooh. You're actually reading my brain. But we've got a toolkit <laughs> that has the risk assessment, which Karen can assist you with. Um, this is not a freebie. Uh, my Scottish heritage is better than what you think it I is. I tried, right? guys. I really did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it has a draft policy process that has clauses of a contract that has pre-employment. Um, and 
Nina will provide the support for that and for the risk assessment part of it, Karen will, but that's coming through in the next week or so. So we'll push that out. We've got one already pushing into education now. So I'll move on very quickly as to that. Let's, let's go on to our, the, the cheat sheet that I promised you on casual conversion last week was me getting ahead of myself. It will come out to you early next week. Um, Matt and I prepared one. It is brilliant, but it related to only one award. We've now done it so it relates to all awards. Um, so just forgive me for making promises I can't deliver. I'm not known for that, am I, Karen? No, no comment. <laughs> mute, mute, mute Jack, Jack, are you there, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's an ad where you call for KFC at that stage. All Thank right, you. let's go into the first case or first major change. The new respect legislation has come through. Timely, this new respect legislation deals with sexual harassment. It makes it a specific protected attribute. It makes it, um, it provides a jurisdiction, the Fair Work Commission, to stop it occurring. It does everything except what it ought to have done, which is to make it a positive duty. And I, can I just explain that a bit? Uh, all women by the age of 40 have endured some form of sexual harassment. That's, that's the evidence. About 20% of women, greater than 20%, the nature of sexual harassment has interfered in their capacity to work safely. All right? That is an epidemic. That is more than any other form of workplace violence or misconduct that we have. You would think a government would go, that's something we should make sure employers have a positive obligation to prevent. In other words, they must demonstrate they have structures in place and they must have a governance structure in place that prevents it from occurring. And be, I can't, I, I'm sort of, I, I just found it breathtaking and it shows that male-based organisations like government continually neglect and ignore the impact of behaviour towards women. Uh, you know, it's this went against went on party lines, and it's, I'm not interested in which party it is because it's got nothing to do with it. The issue here is we have terrible behaviour directed to women in our workplace, which is damaging them, and we know it, and we have the evidence that tells us we know it. Um, and Margaret said, yes, there's a whole lot of the recommendations that didn't come through. It's it's. It's just really disappointing. It's woeful. I think, Karen, there is a way through this for us yeah. as organisations so that we don't get entrapped in my anger against the government and we, we focus on what you can do. Karen, over to you. What can we do to get that positive duty work? Well, well clearly, when we can't rely on legislation to, um, to, to help us or make this, um, this standard, um, what we can do internally is create a governance um, framework around it. And what I mean by that is that we can have our own policies um, that make it really clear and set the standard and expectations in terms of behaviour um, and also reporting. Um, so that is something that, you know, we don't have to wait for and we can do now. And, and the answer is that the positive obligation actually does live in the safety legislation. So remember, you have to do everything that is reasonably practical to prevent injury or illness. Mm -hmm. now, so what is reasonably practical? I know I'm doing this to you again, the four elements of it. It is to identify a hazard. We know sexual harassment is a hazard. And we know the level of risk because I've just told you the prevalence and the impact of it. So frequency and impact are the two issues when we look at risk. So it's exceptionally high risk. What are the controls around that? It's not just education, it's supervision. It's a deliberate process of management that must exist around it. So although they didn't do what they said they were going to do, and they, yes, they've made judges and politicians subject to it. Well, it's about bloody time they did. You know? mm. So so what? The big issue here is the safety legislation mandates a positive obligation that exists on organisations to do it. So although they're silent in the respect legislation, the safety legislation, industrial manslaughter, was designed to deal with the types of this type of impact, which could cause someone's death. Okay. So I, I want you to think about it and I want you to use the safety legislation as your vehicle to get to where you get to because. Um, our government has failed us in providing the duty that should be there. And Karen's observations are right. This should be an issue which is now squarely on board papers. And the other thing, Andrew, is that everyone on this, um, in our community here, um, most of us here are uh, managers, um, directors, you know, we can advocate and we can, we actually have the ability to, to make stuff happen. So that's, mm. a, that's the other good bit. Yeah, and if we could stop putting it in paternalistic things like my daughters or my wife and stop using those sort of property-based concepts to say, I'd want my daughter to be safe. 
I just want people to be safe. I want people to be respected. And when the evidence, once again, speaks so loudly to what that risk is, and it relates to almost entirely one gender, it's pretty bad, isn't it? It's pretty bad. Um, on the discrimination angle, Peggy, Peggy and King, which are two pilots in Qantas, um, were recently dismissed. They were long-haul flight Qantases. And there's been a lot of discussion in workplace, in, in workplace newsletters that this changes the old High Court case in Christie. Christie was a long-haul pilot. There is a convention that many countries have adopted that says if you're over 65 years of age, it doesn't matter how fit you are, they will not let you land. Um, the High Court found that when there is a convention or law that is imposed an obligation on the employer not to permit something to do it, then it is lawful. So it is discrimination, but it is a lawful form of discrimination um, to terminate that person's employment. In Christie, there was a series of arguments around, well, couldn't he do short haul flights? And the answer was by adjusting the roster so that only Christie didn't do the long haul flights, it placed, placed an unreasonable burden upon other pilots. Peggy and King were in the same position as, um, as Christie and the Fair Work Commission had no, no difficulty in dealing with it and going down the same path and said, look, during COVID times, any argument around re reinstatement based on retraining was, was, was crazy because no one knows when anyone's going to fly again and it must be really clear. But there is another case running at the moment called Summers, which is Summers and Qantas, which is running uh, in the federal court. And Summers can do both long haul and short haul flights. And for some reason, the lawyers and media commentators have gotten bit of a flurry about this and said, oh, this really does undermine the Christie decision because some has applied for an injunction to prevent um, him being ter terminated and was granted that injunction. But it's a different set of facts because in that case, he was of a healthy disposition, yes, 65, but could do short haul flights. And the question really is, is, is a disproportionate impact on other pilots by that process? And that'll be heard at trial. So can I just say to you, and there is a number of jurisdictions where people are not allowed to do things, a number of different industries based on an historical understanding of age as, a, as, as an arbitrary method of providing a safe, a safe place of work or safety towards other people. Where that exists, it continues to be good law and the changes to the Victorian legislation around age uh, discrimination will not affect that. So interesting case agitates a really new issue, but most of it's media hype, it's not true. More recent interesting case, not because it's, it's law changing, but because it reflects something that Karen and I have been talking about for a fair period of time, which is Sweeney, the National Disability Insurance Agency, a very senior HR person was made redundant. They paid 48 weeks, that was 330,000. So it wasn't a bad job to be in. Um, Sweeney, Sweeney said, look, I'd made some public disclosures and I'd made some complaints. This is adverse action because I'd exercised workplace rights went before a judge called Phil Burchett, who's a, who's a great judge. And what he, he, the judge said is, look, the process was grossly unfair. There was a decision made, it was made by the head of people, sorry, the, the evidence was collected by the head of people who directed the CEO to make the decision. So the CEO being quarantined from any other issues that existed. Um, the method under which it was done was just grossly unfair, but nonetheless, it was done. And the CEO made, was the sole decision maker based on the evidence that the, that CEO had, they made a decision and the base of that decision was only in relation to the restructure. Therefore, it was a lawful restructure. Therefore, it wasn't adverse action. Would have failed if they were a lower paid employee, unfair dismissal, procedural fairness would have killed it, okay? But at common law and under adverse action, there's no requirement for procedural fairness. I just wanna be clear about that. So don't get distracted during adverse action. And I think Karen and I have said a number of times the importance of quarantining a decision maker and around termination where there's a risk of adverse action is absolutely critical. That is giving them the evidence to make a decision and not polluting them with unnecessary things around the side of it, okay? So a good decision because it tells you what is the correct process and it reminds you that in adverse action, procedural fairness is not a part of it at all. That brings us on to industrial manslaughter, um, which is a major theme of what we're talking about. And I'll switch to Karen shortly. I just want you to know that over the last two years, all the regulators have moved to a more educative role. There's been a low level of prosecution. Um, that's changing 
and all the regulators are, are ramping up and there's greater visits that are occurring and we're seeing the most aggressive regulator, which is in Queensland, launching new industrial manslaughter proceedings against three people. And what we can see now very clearly is that industrial manslaughter will be used in three different sets of facts which they're going to be agitated. In the Western Meat Exporters case, and Queensland is an example, right on it, and their regulator came out very clearly and said, where unguarded machinery could cause death, we're going to use industrial manslaughter. So it's so well known. It's notoriously well known that this is a risk. And you, you can do it. You, you know the risk is fatal if people get, become entrapped in machinery. So traffic management is the other issue, which I have no doubt at all will be a basis. And we've seen ACT uh, launch proceedings in that area, also Queensland, particularly for crane operators who are driving around with elevated loads greater than the, the weight required. And the last one, of course, which industrial manslaughter is designed, is mental health. So they're the three areas where I think we're going to see really renewed focus in the regulators as we emerge out of COVID. And Karen, I, I just want you to share a slide and discuss what does that look like for officers and governance to prevent that risk to your organisation and to your officers? Yep, absolutely. Uh, Sophie, have we got something? But Sophie's on the ball today, isn't she? She is, she is. She is. Uh, although we got a little bit cut off in the end there. It uh, doesn't matter, we'll get through it. So look, um, this slide here is, I've created it for officers in on this call, right? In terms of, from an industrial manslaughter point of view, in terms of governance, what is it that I need to know? What questions should I be asking? And what, inf what how well should I be understanding um, these issues and to, to be able to know what I need to do. So look, in terms of adopting the risk um, management methodology around identifying, assessing, control, reviewing, monitoring, I've really framed this in a way where if I was sitting um, with you um, on the board, um, so this is, remember, with the, these duties here are just for officers, okay? Um, these are the questions that I would ask. And when I say ask, um, I need to ask and feel confident that I understand what is actually occurring um, across the organisation and also be confident that what we're doing is enough. Um, and also understand that ongoing, that I've always got my finger, um, or at least the group, that executive group have got their finger um, on, the, on the pulse. So first, a couple of questions here that I'd ask for, certainly from when identifying um, the, the issues in terms of the safety risk, what are the actual critical risks for fatalities? Um, and what are, for you, as in your organisation, what are the top five and why? Um, and you can look at, of course, you'd have to look at um, what those critical risks are for the, the sector or the industry as well, because you can't ignore that. But there could be additional or slightly different ones based on you know, what you do. Um, thinking also about where is it that these risks actually are? So in terms of is it which sites, areas, which type of settings? Is it people on, you know, while they're, um, if they're driving on the road in terms of the travel lot as part of work, that's still a workplace. So remember, the workplace is not confined to just a physical, um, you know, one physical premise. And who are the people who are most exposed to this risk? So when you do, this is all part of your risk assessment process, right? But you need to be very thorough um, in, in doing this and consider it very broadly. Um, and what is it they can learn from your previous incidents, your near misses, your hazards? Um, that's if you are actually hazard reporting well. And the question is, are you? And do people know how to do that? So we're going through around that and um, going through this list, we've got the risk threshold in terms of the organisation. What is your appetite for risk in the organisation for these things? If the type of work is high risk work where we know that fatalities happen from time to time and there's somehow a, an acceptable level, if you can call it that, I'm not certainly saying I think they're, they're preventable, but if, like, what is that? You need to be able to have a conversation around that um, as, a, as a group. What's your policy and methodology around this? Is it robust enough? Is it practical? And are the people involved, are, do they have the confidence and is it sound um, to be able to identify, assess and, and manage these risks for you? So, Andrew, I don't want to spend probably too long on it, but it's pretty self, like I hope the slide there is quite self-explanatory. No, Karen, I think the slide's brilliant. And if I can just stick over the top of that, your obligations of due diligence, okay? Yeah. And, and Karen's captured through this slides, what are your risks and what are your core risks? Um, you've got to have the knowledge of the law and the knowledge of the risk. So it's not just, so Karen said, here's your risk. What you then have to do is apply 
an up-to-date level of knowledge of the law that applies to that. You've got to be satisfied, as Karen says, there is a system that has integrity and that is measurable against that. And the last part of this is, and Karen's nailed this, is you've got to have an allocation of resource based on that level of risk. So as a board, you must apportion a resource. And this is the big problem with most boards is they, they get a bit of the risk, but what they don't say is, so where's our budget? What's the budget on this? They think that the budget for safety is um, PPE and mm -hmm. the OHS person. Well, it's actually not, it's around supervision. Because if we look at the hierarchy of controls, one of the core elements of, of, of say, yeah, there's capital. Where's the capital part in here? Mm -hmm. where, where are we going to actually stop the problems that are around um, unguarded machinery? Well, where's the capital outlay for that? Where's, where, where is it? Where's the supervision cost for when we can't guard something? Okay. They're things I want you to really agitate at a board level and say, when we make a decision around doing something, we must talk about what the safety issue is. And then we must put a resource or a budget that sits behind it. Yeah, and absolutely. And Andrew, resource, I might add to that as well. So when you say and you claim that safety is really important and it's what you do, so where exactly is it on the agenda and how high up is it? Yeah. yeah? And I'm talking at the board level too. So anyway, so hopefully that's helpful to you. No, no, it's great, Karen. Thank you very much. Let's let's go on to the um, case study, which is a, a complex and difficult problem today. Some easy parts of it. This is based on the new respect um, process that's come through. Beth was the senior sales manager for Doubt Free Security. DFS sold security into large commercial property and major events. Beth was the only woman and reported the national head of sales, Fred O'Brien. She was 34 years old with two children and lived with a husband who was known to have alcohol problems and jealousy issues. Beth's husband attended the last Christmas party and abused a young man chatting to Beth. Beth had disclosed to Fred and the head of HR, the mix of alcohol and his jealousy, worse when drunk, was a real problem because he would follow her and check through her phone. Fred was recently divorced, 43-year-old man who was attracted to Beth. He sent her a joke by email one day, which was a bit racy, and she responded with lol and a gift for being naughty. Fred gradually sent more and more jokes, each a little bit more sexual, and her responses were slower, respectful, but brief. When she saw him at work, not often now because of lockdown, she appeared a little shy, but would smile. One night after a few drinks, Fred sent her a WhatsApp message saying he was attracted to her. She said that was very sweet, but she was married and warned him about the messages on her phone and that he, that is the husband, looked at her messages. But Fred couldn't stop. Alone in lockdown, lonely and now infatuated with the idea of Beth, he sent more open messages speaking of his love for her. The situation was starting to affect Beth's mental health. She twice sent messages begging him to stop, saying she couldn't fall in love with him because she was married and please stop. She was trying to be nice about it. Beth was now on antidepressants and had told HR. They asked if she wanted her to do anything about it and she just said, I wanted to stop. HR didn't do anything and she hadn't made a formal complaint under the policy. Beth felt her hands were tied. So let's go to the poll and your time starts now. No music this week, no jingle. Where's the jingle? So it's been so hot on everything else. Where's the music? Yes, the first two questions are pretty easy. It started to get a bit harder after that. Okay, that's good feedback, Joe. What did Joe say? He's saying the silence is better than last week's. Oh, know? that's so unkind, Joe. That, I, I, look, I even got a bit of a, a bit of a dance up last week. <laughs> I think we're pretty close. Um, yeah. So yeah. maybe ten more seconds, and we'll call it quits. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, we've got eighty percent of people. Okay. Well, let's call it quits now. Then if that's all, all right. right. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right. And here we go. I'll just talk through some things. Can I, can I just say, um, in safety law, there is no obligation for a formal complaint, OK? The mere knowledge of a hazard enlivens a business's obligation to do everything that is reasonably practical to prevent injury. So in this case, if we can be absolutely clear, yes, this is sexual harassment. Why? Because it is unwanted sexual 
sexual advance. Remember, harassment normally requires more than one, you know, bullying, more than one episode. Sexual harassment doesn't. One episode is enough. Can I say to you that the courts frown upon sexual harassment so heavily that the, the damages that are now awarded in sexual harassment um, now equal that at common law? So it is very common for a, a, for a serious sexual harassment claim if it now goes through one of the anti-discrimination um, jurisdictions to have general damages of well over $100,000. So there is a recognition by the courts, although not by our parliament, that this is a serious thing that must be stopped. So this is sexual harassment. The next question is, could she now go to the Fair Work Commission to get a stop order? Yes, she can, okay? For us, remember that's a crazy place to go. Remember the bullying jurisdiction is almost never used. I think in the first two years of its operation, only a thousand people went to it and yet bullying again is rife. The difficulty is that if an order is made in that jurisdiction, it is an unlimited capacity to make orders in designing your workplace to prevent it. It's not a good place to be, is it? So the answer to two is yes, you can, but do you really want to get there? And that goes back to Karen's earlier point about, please get the governance of this right so that you're never in a position where you end up in that jurisdiction. Third question is Beth's husband read the message and in a drunken rage fought with her and killed her. Could DFS and to an extent, could Fred be charged with industrial manslaughter? Well, let's look at the, the parts of it. Was there a duty of care? Because that's the first part of industrial manslaughter. And the answer is yes, there is a duty of care that existed there. Um, was there gross negligence? Okay, so what we know is that HR and Fred knew that the husband was a volatile and dangerous person, okay? Particularly with alcohol. And they also knew that he read messages and HR knew that these messages were being sent by Fred so HR, who is the organisation, forget about Fred for a second, HR knew that Fred was sending messages which were, which were explicit and which, if the husband read, would motivate him to take action, which was dangerous. Okay? Fred, as a senior person in the organisation, remember, for industrial manslaughter and all disorders, the, the mind of the person doing the thing is taken as the organisational knowledge clearly knew what the risks were, had been told to stop and kept doing. So the answer are, yes, there is a good chance, even though the death was at the hand of somebody else, he could have been heard distracted walking across a road because of it and being run down by a driver would still be industrial manslaughter. He's seeking higher damages. Yes, uh, David, yes, a stop sexual harassment order, if, particularly if it wasn't complied, would go to higher damages. Um, the answer is, if it's really bad, you can actually get an injunction in the federal court. So that's a much more powerful method of actually stopping it and would increase penalties if the person did it again and would be a contempt of the court. So a clever plaintiff lawyer would go directly to injunct to stop the sexual harassment because the case would finish overnight once you got the injunction because the reputational damage would be massive. But any breach of a stop order in the Fair Work Commission is not a contempt, whereas a breach of a of an injunction is a contempt of court and a person would be jailed, okay? So that's why you'd use the federal court. Um, the next question, and this is Hall's case, um, which is in the event of Beth's death, could her children successfully seek benefits under workers' compensation law and common law as dependents? The answer is absolutely yes. And there is a case, as you know, of the mortgage brokers that, that occurred um, six months ago during COVID, where a person who was on call was killed by uh, an enraged and drunken husband, okay? not in these circumstances, not with these drivers. The driver here is known. The sexual harassment is known. The method of the sexual harassment is known. And HR feel because there's no formal complaint, they can't do anything about it. Appalling, okay? Now it's appalling, I'm out of the facts. So I'm allowed to say I'm appalled by it. But that just shows you how industrial manslaughter because it is the only prosecutable offence under safety legislation where the death can occur outside of work, okay? So that's it, guys. That's um, been interesting and challenging. I'm sorry, we've, I've been probably a little bit more didactic than usual, but I'm afraid the respect legislation just left me dry. And um, I think Margaret pointed out that of the recommendations that were made by, by an appointee of the government, very few have been taken up. You know, less than 10% have been implemented. And that's, that's pretty sad, isn't it? 
So let's get out there in governance land and do something about it. Karen, thank you once again. And thank you, Jack, for being such a, such a beautiful boy today. Have a great weekend. And thank you all for joining in. Cheers. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye, everyone.